Smith, who is chairman of the government now that Workforce Council. Uh, and uh, he, he sends his regrets that he could not be here today, but he did enjoy being with you at the board meeting a few months ago. Uh, he, he really, he still talks about it. He had a great time. And uh, uh, he looks forward to the partnership that we can continue to build between business and education. And uh, that's why we're here this morning. The governor asked us to put together some recommendations about ways we can permanently weld together the business community and the education community. And y'all are a huge part of that. And so um, one of the recommendations that we are thinking about coming forward with uh, has to do with creating a feedback loop. And the legislature created us, they wanted us to create a feedback loop between business and education. So that way we had a customer client relationship uh, with education. And that's something that we are very committed to. Mark Miller is an attorney at Baltimore Bingham in Birmingham. Uh, she and Wesley Britt and Jared White and Blaine Gallagher have spent a lot of time uh, focused on this. Uh, it's something we're extremely excited about. Uh, if you have any questions at all, we want we want this to be something that is a resource to you. Uh, we want it to be something that is a resource to our business community uh, because we truly believe in its uh, capacity to, to really do some great things. So uh, with that, uh, Martha uh, is going to talk. Uh, she, she knows uh, she holds the keys here. So, uh, if you have any questions about anything, she's very conversational. So, uh, I'm a lawyer, I'm a talker. That's right. So uh, please feel free to uh, stop her with any questions that you have along the way. But we look forward to working with you and uh, <coughs> the uh, partnership that we continue to have and we'll hopefully continue to have along the way. So thank you very much. So, Wonderful. Yeah, so just to reiterate what Arlene was saying, this is one of the advisory recommendations. It's Purely a recommendation at this point. It's not anything that's being implemented, but it's something that the council has been thinking about and really taking a hard look, talking to other states about what they're doing, talking to the data quality campaign, which I believe a lot of you are familiar with in DC, really making sure that this is an educated decision that we're making that can advance student <coughs> achievement and the achievement of the citizens in our state um, as much as possible while also protecting them to the maximum extent possible. So with that, I'm gonna dive in We've got two recommendations that are related that are coming out of a committee that's focused on collaborating with education. And the first one is establishing feedback loops, which is really the line of communication between our regional workforce councils and our local education entities to make sure that those programs that the different community colleges and high schools are offering, whether that's school enrollment programs, that those are actually, they're offering programs for, for example, the right number of seats for the number of employers that are demanding it. So we're trying to make sure that we're maximizing opportunities there. And I wanted to highlight that, that's not the focus of mine today, but the other <coughs> part, this P20W longitudinal data system really plays into it. Um, and I'm gonna start for everybody in the room from a very broad perspective. I think y'all are probably familiar with these systems, but I wanted to make sure that I set the framework <coughs> for what it is and also what it isn't. Um, because the P20W data system is something that's really the, one of the core recommendations that it's gonna give you a great opportunity equalize opportunities for students and then to maximize those. So just as an overview of the feedback loop, what we're looking at, this graphic shows a talent supply chain, and that's kind of the terminology that we've adopted in industry terms um, to really look at. There's a whole lot of different people that are influencing our talented students, whether that's you know, education, which we recognize is a huge portion of it. That's at least 12 years of the students' life. There's also different training programs like AIDT and different groups that are helping and we want to make sure that everyone is working together <coughs> to really provide the best outcome possible, uh, be that college, be that a career. We want to advance the outcomes for students to the maximum extent by making sure that everybody's communicating. And that's really <coughs> the goal of the feedback loop. Um, so you'll see this is really all comes around to communication, making sure that you know, industry is getting feedback and also that education is getting feedback to industry about what they think is valuable. So I just got a couple of points up there about the different ways that they can collaborate. Um, it's really just opening up the line of communication between the two because we recognize that's valuable for student outcomes. This really shows the, the pipeline in action, so to speak, which really we're looking at our regional workforce development councils, which I'm sure most of y'all are familiar with. They operate throughout the country. They focus on what we need for that region, whether it's aerospace down in South Alabama or whether that's our armory in DC. But And the result, and I think this is one of our more powerful slides, what we're looking to do with this recommendation is really to make sure that we're providing the best training and education possible to students. So 
So we recognize that that creates a very strong workforce, <coughs> and a strong workforce paid more tax dollars, and it results in a better economy, and more tax dollars increases our education trust fund, and actually it, it provides for itself, and it's a great process by which we can really increase opportunities long term. So with that, I'm going to go into what's really the core of the presentation today, which is P20W's longitudinal data system. And before I really define what that is, the <coughs> issue that we're looking at right now is everybody has different systems where they're collecting information about students or about our population. And our K-12 system, y'all done an incredible job <coughs> of maximizing student privacy and protection and creating a system where you know exactly what happens when a student moves from their elementary school into junior and you have that all set up really well. Unfortunately, we don't have really good links so that our kindergarten teachers can tell our preschool exactly how that early reading initiative panned out. We don't actually have the links there. And the same thing with when our students leave 12th grade and move into post-secondary or move into workforce training programs. We don't have a link there to help us understand how effective those programs are being. And so we've got effectively silos of really helpful information but it's not being linked across the system. So a P20W system, P20W <coughs> is a term of art that's used in the industry, the P standing for preschool or early learning education, and it's not just through 12. Um, right now we have a K-12 system um, in terms of this <coughs> data. P20W actually goes beyond the 12th grade through additional years of graduate education, and the W stands for workforce. And so what it does is it actually links that information over time. So rather than me being able to say, I know what, you know, where this student is in the fourth grade, we can actually see on a de-identified basis that student as they move from fourth grade to fifth grade and then from fifth grade on into the next step of education. And what this would be doing is not changing the information that we're collecting or that we are learning from. We're not increasing that. Instead, it would be using that information more effectively. So this would not be an increase um, to the data that's collected. It, it would keep the data. The data is already there. It's just a matter of using it effectively to better student outcomes. So a couple of statistics. These come from the Data Quality Campaign's 2014 analysis. Um, and they have, based on the surveys of all of the states, everyone participated, 46 other states have built and implemented data longitudinal data over time. And 41 states have actually developed a research agenda. So whether that is through an office of government or through collaborations with universities are actually purposefully researching and trying to learn from the data. They want to understand how to intervene earlier to make sure that we are really improving education and workforce outcomes. And this is a map that the Data Quality Campaign has about the states that have actually built or are in the process of implementing a longitudinal data repository. And it's, it pretty starts, there's a whole lot more states on there that are in red, um, indicating that they have this than are in gray. And it's something that would really, you know, for Alabama to continue to compete and to provide meaningful educational outcomes and workforce outcomes for students is something that would be very helpful for us to have and take into account. So this is, of course, the key concern in all of this. How do we protect this data? That's a primary concern. Before you open with this, you want to come at it from the perspective of how do we make sure that we maximize the protection? That's in everyone, that's everyone's first thought. How do we keep students from having any kind of compromise, any of their information that could be used to harm them in any way? So I'm going to use a couple terms of art to make sure that everybody understands them just because they get tossed around. You've probably heard them in the news, you've probably heard about encryption, and are wondering, well, what is it? Um, just to make sure that everybody understands. So as information would actually be provided from the Department of Education or Department of Children and Affairs, when it comes in, it's encrypted, which is a term that means they basically they're, they're protecting that information so that an unauthorized user can't view it. So as that information is transmitted in, it's protected during that process. And it goes into a centralized or state-operated data system that would actually store it. Anything that comes out is de-identified. The identification is a fancy way of saying you can't tell whose it is. So it's not just taking out their name, their birth date, their social security number. It's also removing information that if you were able to match up a couple of different points, that you wouldn't be able to reverse engineer who it was. So for example, if you were able to see that at that point it was somebody who lived in this zip code and went to this elementary. 
elementary school and then this college and then if you could actually link that up and point it to an individual that's that narrow that's still not to be identified so we want to make sure that there's no chance of ever going back and saying who an individual student is this is not a means of generating report cards for students it's a means of understanding how cohorts of students are progressing um, and that also applies not just to students but to their parents we don't want parents to be identifiable either so we want to make sure that in all instances we're protecting students the only people who even have access to the identified information would be our education leadership and agencies and researchers who have been pre-screened and qualified to see that the identified information so yet again no one is going to be seeing the information that's actually students personally identifiable um, just the researchers will have that so that they can run effective studies. Any information that's made available to our policymakers and to the general public would be aggregated, which is a fancy way of saying you'd only show it in summary format. So instead of showing you individual data points, you would instead get to see that 45 students graduated from this career tech program and were, out, were able to get jobs, or 54 students got scholarships to move on to post-secondary. So you would have summary form information. So you're really going to, we're going to really kind of set this up and recommend that it be set up in a way that minimizes any opportunity for students to ever be identified. So moving on, these are some of the key data characteristics that we think are best practices based upon all of the information that we've reviewed, all of the scholarly research. So the first one is the data needs to be longitudinal. Right now we have static data in a lot of instances. We want the data to actually paint a picture over time so that we can actually make more informed decisions based on a student's or a cohort of students' pathways. The data needs to be actual. It needs to be something where we can actually use it to make decisions. There's a lot of data that's not helpful for us to make decisions with. It needs to be contextual, which means that it needs to make sense. We need to understand the student in the context in which they are operating and learning. And the last one is it needs to be interoperable, meaning that the data needs to make sense across the different groups that have that data, whether that's moving from Department of Children's Affairs into K-12, or moving from K-12 and beyond, it needs to actually link together. So there's four main reasons that our committee has come up with that really enunciate why we need this. The first one being advancing student achievement. That's everyone's primary goal. Um, the second one is to create a tool to address the skills gap and make sure that our students are ready for college and are ready for careers and that we know just how ready they are. The third is to really approve accountability for our resources to make sure that you have the information to know, okay, if there's a, a great program that we've heard wonderful reviews about, is it working? And if it is, then you can put more money behind that and you can actually support programs that you know are effective. And the last one is to maximize our existing resources using the information that we've already got. We already have this information, we're just not using it. So this slide, the text is kind of small for everyone in the back, but that's because there's so many beneficiaries listed on here. Um, it's not just our education and our teachers and our students, it's also our business and philanthropy leaders who are able to provide funding and they can provide scholarships when they know the program works. It's our policymakers like yourselves that can really use this information to make great decisions you know, it's industry, they can better understand who's coming down the pipeline, who's going to be available to work for me. Um, if, you know, education leadership can take this and say, okay, we found a really great innovative science program in this school that's really producing great outcomes. Let's implement this in other schools and let's suggest this is a best practice to solve. Parents can actually look at this and understand which programs have been the most successful and can help make decisions for their students. you're all very familiar with. FERPA provides what I like to think of as the floor, the, the baseline protections that protect the privacy of educational records. So it restricts the provision of personally identifiable information about students outside of certain permitted uses to improve education. The result of, you know, the, the impact of FERPA on this system is that Alabama would comply with these standards. These standards aren't the minimum and Alabama could apply even more stringent standards to protect student, uh, student information. So it's the floor there, are, you know, everyone has a critique of every law out there. Just because we're complying with it doesn't mean we can do more. So I want to make sure that that's clear. And the big benefit of FERPA is that FERPA prevents states from sending personally identifiable information to the federal government. So based on FERPA, a P20W data system could never be used as a tool to send information to the federal government about students. They are prohibited from receiving 
Actually, the people, the protection of people rights amendment, which requires parental consent, the survey is about certain sensitive topics. And this is something that we're also recommending that we go online and we say, you know what, this information is not directly relevant to assessing education outcomes and workforce outcomes. So this data system doesn't need to include information about sexuality, about religion, um, about certain topics that really just do not directly implicate educational outcomes. And the third one is the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which prevents commercial websites from collecting information about children under the age of 13. And this one is helpful to highlight because no private entity, no commercial entity is going to be better in their business because they're going to get access to student information from this. There's not going to be a textbook name that's going to have better marketing and tell. That's not what this is for. They won't get access, and they can't get access. Yeah. Yes. Um, children. Yes. Under 13. <coughs> uh, is there something that protects children over, over the age of 13? At this point, there's not, although President Obama did just announce a new proposed act that will likely expand the protection to other students. But again, with that law that protects children under 13, that's the, that's the floor not the ceiling, and Alabama can protect children and require that to protect children all the way through the education system. Yes. <coughs> Non-commercial websites collecting information? It's very limited. It's a very nuanced law, but they're basically protecting. You have to get parental consent before you start collecting Is information. Is there a penalty? I mean, they're violating the law, so <laughs> there Is there a financial penalty? I don't know about the financial penalties and what those are, but I mean, I think they can have sanctions violated other laws, you know. So I don't know the specific penalties that we have to get. So based upon what we've heard from other states and the feedback that we've gotten from best practices, we've outlined five steps that we're recommending for actually establishing a system in Alabama. And I'm going to go through the first three in detail, but the first one is you have to you have to actually set it up. You have to pass laws of some sort, whether that's an executive order, whether that's legislation that's created. And then you develop a system that governs it. That includes policies and procedures that protect the data and the information and that really tell us how it's operated. Once we've got the policies in place and not before, then you actually start building. You have the policies and you have the guidelines before you start the building. It's easy to try to get ahead of yourself, but we have very deliberate steps that we think need to be completed in order. The fourth step is to actually link the system. So make sure that the data matches up as it moves from one agency to the other. And the fifth one is to develop a resource agenda and to really start learning from the information once we've got it. So a couple of suggested components that we think need to be in the implementing law, and by putting it in the implementing law, this means that they won't change, that, that this sets for certain requirements. We want transparency requirements, such as we want there to be a, an inventory that's in plain English so you can see exactly what information is being included, being included in the system. We want parents to be able to understand exactly how it's being um, the second one, establish the relevant structure from a more general perspective to make sure that there are certain policies and procedures and how it operates. They don't have the freedom to, once the system is set up, to start changing it. There are going to be certain structural requirements in place. We also want to put certain baseline privacy and security protections that could never be minimized um, and to require an annual review of those. And if there is something that works out, if there's some, you know, we learn of some potential weakness, but you review that and then you change it and you update it and you make it stronger as you learn because we all know as you do something, you learn more from it. We want to make sure it becomes stronger over time but never weaker. And the last one is a prohibition that would be in there from the beginning on using the data for anything that doesn't benefit education and workforce outcomes. So the second part about developing a robust governance system, you should recognize the quote in red at the bottom. This is your language and we very much so value that and we agree that as a committee that the appropriate use of data is essential to accelerate the student learning. Program financial effectiveness and efficiency and policy development and that's exactly um, the type of philosophy that this governance system would embody is, is the policy that you can pass about a year ago. There we go. So some of the governance policies, we've got some different, this aligns a little bit with what I was saying with the legislation, but these are some of the types of provisions that need to be in the governance policy. So we want procedures for exactly how the data is used, how it's collected, how it's destroyed um, once it's not useful anymore. And that inventory that I highlighted, we want to make sure that that's clear. We need strategies to make sure that the public understands 
exactly what's happening because this is not some this is a state resource. This is not something that should be happening behind closed doors. We need a security plan that would include everything down to having background checks for those that have access and that are working on the system, um, doing different risk assessments and periodic audits, and lastly, a record keeping plan so that we can actually really evaluate this program and have opportunities to adjust. <coughs> So these are a couple of, this is a list of what we're initially proposing would be the providers <coughs> of data. So you'll see Department of Education is in there. We put this in somewhat chronological order over an individual's life, but there's a whole lot of information that when put together um, and studied and on a longitudinal basis would really paint a more accurate picture about how students are progressing. And the Department of Education by most accounts has the best data right now and you've done a great job of ensuring that you've been protecting students the whole time they're in the K-12 system and we want to build upon your successes and to really make sure that before your students get to K-12 that they are the most prepared and that we understand that preparation process and then once they leave K-12 we want to continue them as successful students as they go on to higher education as they go into careers after higher education or if they go directly into careers we want to make sure that whatever their life is that we're preparing them as well as we can because that's the key to success for our state. What is the top end of the question? I mean, what age? You know, you can do. So it really depends on what we're looking at. P20W is really looking at the entry into the workforce. And once you're in the workforce, that data is less relevant. We want to know exactly how you move into higher education. So that would go through that P20, that it says 20. That means that you go get a PhD, I think, is the only way you can do 20 years of straight learning. Um, but it would go and just really track as you enter into the workforce to see, did you actually get a job in the, with the major or with the you know, certifications that you were studying um, to achieve? So we want to just see that entry into the workforce. That's the initial goal of that. So it's not the whole state over time. It's really focused on <laughs> educational preparedness and then entry into the workforce. At this point, you've got great policies in place, and you have set forth a really great example for the state. This would need its own policy because it would be applied to multiple entities. Those policies would really play very well in tandem with the policies that you have for your data. So you've already set a great foundation. You've been a leader in this area. Um, the policies for this data system would really be more focused on operations. So the information would be coming from the state. So it wouldn't be coming directly from the you know, superintendents. It would be coming from your executive. I mean, as far as the security of data yes. from the local schools. Oh, the security of from the local schools? So we've talked about potentially having recommendations for having the security, but we recognize that the security of <coughs> the local schools, that's your jurisdiction. And that's something that, as you want to look at that, that's a, yeah, that's definitely, we understand and we're making recommendations on a state level, but we recognize your authority over your local schools and we'd be happy to talk to you about any recommendations that we think as you've learned about it, how to maximize the privacy and security for students. Excuse me. Yeah. Really, the local data will be housed at the State Department and you'll get it from the State Department. Yes, correct. that's correct. Okay. That is correct. Can we get a copy of the PowerPoint? Yes. I just was about to ask Yes, yes. yes. We'll get, we'll get, we'll get, we'll get, we'll get, we'll get, Yes, definitely. If you have any data, great. Um, this slide on linking our data systems is my, my analogy that I like to use about it is we've got effectively multiple gauges of railroad track right now in the state with our data systems. And so you can drive a railroad car, but you can't link over into the next one. And so what we need to do is make our systems interoperable, meaning that we can actually translate that data between groups. And so that's going to be more of a technical uh, background. We want to make sure there's quality matching so that there's not erroneous different records in there, and I'm sure that you can imagine that the issues of the database, and so we've come up with a lot of recommendations from a technical perspective on how to make sure that we have a really high quality system. This really goes to the quality of the data. And then the fifth step is developing a research agenda. So we want this to be purposeful. Uh, we want to come at this with really deliberate questions that we know are relevant to student achievement. Um, and Along the same line, we also want a very rigid process by which somebody could request to get data, not just anybody, 
to get that de identified information. That person may need a background check. That person may need to undergo, you know, certain different security clearances. But we want to make sure that we have just as rigid of a process for researchers as we do for the staff that's operating. Yeah. Um, would we talk about information? that wouldn't be relevant and we wouldn't be needed. So for example, extracurricular activities, if a student is on a sports team or if they're involved in you know, cheerleading or yearbook staff, that information is not the type of information that's helpful to have on in a system like this. It's helpful for the school. The school needs to know exactly what the students are doing, but if it's not directly relevant to assessing educational outcomes and workforce outcomes, it doesn't need to be a part of the system. We want limited information that's directly relevant. So it would be more um, program enrollment achievement on certain examinations, if there's some certain standardized tests that students are taking, we would want to know how they're performing because it gives us a benchmark to evaluate. Um, but there's a lot of information about students. You know, their birthday is not helpful to know if they have a they're young for their grade or old for their grade. That's not directly relevant. It's helpful for the local schools, but it's not helpful to the system. So it's really a limited and tailored set of information for evaluating education workforce outcomes. So this is just a slide about what we're estimating the cost to be based on our discussions with other states. Um, we're estimating that it's going to approximately cost $3 million to set it up. And that's 700000 not million. Um, on this, on this year. <laughs> that was going to be bad. I'm going to get shut down if I gave a $700 million price tag. Um, but we're estimating that it would approximately cost for about five staff members about $700,000 a year to operate it, including technical costs. And there's that. It's, that's all. It's, that's all. But the, and what's amazing to think about? Okay, so for seven hundred thousand dollars a year, think about the opportunities to evaluate programs and for you to you've got a budget that you've got to deal with every year and look at for schools and for the state. Think about the availability to really make informed decisions using that. That seven hundred thousand dollars, I would assume, would pay for itself every single year with the ability to make informed decisions. Um, and we're expecting there to be grant funding available that um, would come from the U.S. Department of Education. They've got a grant that they've awarded, and we're one of three states that haven't received it. It hasn't been published yet. We're expecting it any day. We were expecting it to be announced in December. It may be announced any day now. Um, they, they're saying January now, but that's an opportunity. And the estimates that we've heard would actually match exactly with that $3 million initial cost. So it could be something that's not a direct cost to set up for the state, which would be ideal. So the funding available for that. So those staff members would be here at the Department of Education? It depends. Where the, the structure of that is really up to how the implementing legislation or executive order, how that's set up. Um, so that's something that hasn't been decided. So, But there would need to be an office. It's a dedicated group of people who they wake up every day wanting to make sure they're maximizing the use of that data, they're protecting that data, um, and they're running that system. Yes, It would be something that's going on at the state level. So this is not, because it's not just K-12, Department of Education, it's, it's affecting a whole lot of different groups in the state. This is something that would likely be its own budget. So it's not something that we're looking to pull money from the Department of Education. It's really we're looking to pull money on a state, pull money on a state basis, but then you have a resource available to you. Yes. Just follow-up to Mary Scott's question.
concerns, and those are concerns that we had. And we talked to states, for example, Washington State. We talked to them. They've got a really great system. But I've been they're in a, State. They're they in a presentation actually there, but also yes. um, in Oregon, where I heard the same presentation. Well, it, th this is this sounds great, but there are a lot of problems that that I know you you've discussed with other states. But I think we're at an advantage in that we are not among the first, and perhaps we are good. among the last three. Well, that's mm -hmm. that's the good thing because we have a Washington. They're a tech hub, and every couple of years they would come up with some new technology they wanted to implement in the system. <coughs> you know, the whole cost would start over again because they would need to bring in new technology. And they've made their system so expensive as a result of that that it's it's almost wasted a lot of the resources that they have. And so we want to make sure that we're learning from what these other states are doing. Um, there are states that have done this really well, and there are states that haven't done it well. And we want to learn from that. The other interesting thing is that they actually did praise Alabama, and we were one of the examples of, of a good policy that they were that they put up. And they've done that Which in national Which leads me to another question. What is, and I assume you're coming to that point, what is the governance structure? Besides bringing all of these people together, who are the five staff members? What is the governance structure? So the governance structure is something that, you know, it obviously has, it's just a recommendation at this point, but it's being proposed either an independent office or an office that's a part of somewhat of an independent agency, which the independent agency <coughs> really 